Hey guys, it's Freaky Informer, back with part 2 of the case of the cleaners. If you haven't seen the first video, you should go watch it, so you know what's going on in this one. Last week we talked about some background on this group of serial killers and went into some detail on one of their victims. Please remember that scenes up ahead are going to be disturbing as they describe death and other grim topics. Now, back into some insight into Lobacheva's character. Upon searching the women's apartment, they found a surprisingly surviving pet rabbit living in squalor. The flat stank, and personal items were scattered around the living space. From what's made available to the public from the search, it seems as though Lobacheva is a hoarder. However, personal effects are not the only items she hoarded. Within the apartment, police found souvenirs of the murders, polaroid images of the gang's victims with their abdomen sliced open, and dismembered body parts were found along with a stash of five weapons, two of which were switchblades. One knife, a box cutter, and one retractable blade were also found within this stash. What was on Lobacheva's laptop was even more telling of her disgusting fascination with death. Others dying, specifically, was Lobacheva's obsession. Lobacheva's laptop contained a step-by-step -step guide to murder, as well as hundreds of files containing depictions of torture and executions. These pictures and videos were discovered by investigators in folders labelled Tenderness and Need This. Perhaps these scenes are what drove her to immortalise the cleaner's victims in the famed Polaroids. Keeping images of her victims exuded even more power over her victims after the five were finished with them. Sanitator 88 completed every single unspeakable murder together, exerting inhuman brutality over innocent victims. Just like Alonia Shitsik, the victim from last week, every single victim sustained stabbing injuries. The 14 others likely experienced the same brutality and luring by the killers. However, only the body stump sites and some of the victims' injuries are currently available. I will briefly run through the locations and states that the victims were left in. Victim number two was left at the central Moscow Hippodrome, a horse racing track. Their body was littered with injuries, of which 18 were hammer blows and 51 were generic stab wounds. The cleaner's third victim was dumped in Bogovoya Station, with 35 stab wounds. Victim number 4 was found under a bridge near Workers' Village. They had 46 stab wounds of varying depths on their body, as well as two contusions from a large stone. Victims 5 and 6 were found together on Izmailovsky Boulevard. One target had 15 stab wounds and 15 injuries from a hammer while the others sustained 13 stab wounds. The Filevsky Park area was the cleaner's seventh mark stump site. This person was stabbed 48 times. The next victim, number eight, was abandoned in the Nagonaya metro station. They had been knifed nine times. Nine was stabbed viciously 50 times and left in Malway in Odinstovo. Sanatater 88's 10th victim received a mix of stab wounds and hammer blows, with 48 of the former and 6 of the latter. The body was found in Kurskaya metro station some days later. Bailak Boulevard's body was stabbed 84 times before being left in the area. The 12th target of Sanatater 88 was quite possibly the most brutalized. They were found in Kuskovo, a large summer home on the outskirts of its land. 171 stab wounds were found in this mark's body, and the five strikes from the hammer were so powerful that the brain matter was found 16 feet from the body. Although three other victims remain, only two have details of their injuries, numbers 13 and 14. These two were found on Bryansky Puff Street with one sustaining 42 stab wounds and two hammer blows, and the other sustaining 35 stab wounds. As you may have noticed, these unrelated and barbaric attacks all had a similar MO. And in the autumn of 2014, Moscow's law enforcement realized this. 
After this was realized, the operatives in the investigation compiled the multiple singular cases into one large case. Even with multiple cases showing possible motive, the investigators took quite a bit of time to make a break in the case of the murders in Moscow. While the examiners were certain that the criminals' motives were supporters of neo-Nazi ideologies, they could not find evidence of the crimes in any virtual sphere. Essentially, there was no trace of evidence in the already known extremist groups online. In wake of this, the Russian Security Service and Investigative Committee were granted permission from the government to track mobile phones that had been in the areas of the murders. Upon examination, these government bodies discovered that several mobile phone numbers overlapped in these areas at the times of the murders. The Federal Security Service took note of the possible suspects. However, this wasn't what brought the investigators to find the cleaners. On his way home from work in the early hours of the morning, an unnamed Jan Er didn't see the two delinquents approaching from behind. It was the night of February 15, 2015 and the janitor was making his way through the Vikimov train station. Presumably, either Volkov or Nasusov struck the janitor in the head with a hammer, as per Sanitary 388's usual ritual. However, would-be murder number 15 would be the cleaner's downfall. The late-night worker was in much better health than previous victims, and thus he was strong enough to resist his attackers. He put up such a fight against Volkov and Narsisov that the two were forced to flee into the night. After surviving the attack, the janitor was able to report the incident to police, describing his assailants in great detail. Four days later, on the 19th of February, Lobacheva and Volkov were detained. Their addresses calculated based on CCTV evidence of them moving about the city. The two were not suspected of murder, but after the detainment of the other three, Sanatator 88 confessed to the killings around Moscow. After their confessions, authorities were able to track down videos on the internet of the murders which the cleaners had recorded. In April of 2017, the investigations into the gang's murders officially ended. The case was then brought to the Moscow City Court. Elena Lobacheva demanded that the five were convicted in the crime which the court obliged. For weeks, starting in late May of 2017, the judge and jury were presented with evidence of the 15 attacks, 14 of which were fatal. By the end of the trial in mid-June, the jury had seen hundreds of distressing photos, and flinched for many of them. The only person to show up to support the cleaners was Lobacheva's mother, who claimed she didn't realise that her daughter harboured this level of evil within her. In June of 2017, the jury announced their verdict for the five members of the cleaners. They found Vlatov, Lobacheva, Karatev and Pavlov guilty and undeserving of leniency. This essentially means that the four would not be able to have their sentences commuted, remitted or suspended. Their sentencing would be exactly what they served. Narsisov was found guilty of attempted murder, but no verdict on leniency was reached. Six jurors argued in favour of it, while six argued against the possibility. Prosecutors in court proposed that Vlatov committed 14 acts of murder, five of which he acted alone in. Six of the 14 murders were to participated in by Lobacheva, while she also observed five of them. Two of the murders were committed by Vlatov, Karatev and Lobacheva together, and two were orchestrated by Vlatov and Pavlov together. Votov and Narsisov also attempted a murder together, but failed. Pavlov, Karatev and Votov also robbed two people, with one of the attacks resulting in Votov killing the victim. The cleaners received their sentences on October 23, 2017. Pavlov, Votov received a life sentence with no leniency. Elena Lobacheva will be in prison for 13 years and Maxim Pavlov was sentenced to nine years and six months. The three are serving their respective incarcerations in penal colonies. A penal colony or exile colony is a settlement used to exile prisoners and separate them from the general population by placing them in a remote location, often an island or distant colonial territory. The final two cleaners, 
Vladislav Karatev and Artur Narsisov were sentenced to his respective 16 years and 9 years and 6 months, which were to be served in corrective labour colony. Corrective labour colonies are essentially modern gulags, combining penal detention with compulsory work. As of May 2021, the time at which this episode was written, Fuatov has his entire life sentence to serve, and Lobacheva still has nine years left on her sentence. Pavlov still has about five years ahead of him in an exile colony. Karatev must serve another 12 years, while Narsisov has theoretically got five more years of incarceration ahead of him. However, it is not known when he will be up for parole or able to appeal his sentence to shorten it. If we've learned anything from this episode of Callous Crimes, it's that hatred gets you nowhere good. That's it for today's episode, guys. I know it was a really heavy episode and very disheartening. If it wasn't for Solidarity Zone's fight for independent journalism, information would have been much harder to come by for the cleaners case. To help them pay journalists' legal fees, you can find the link in the description. I've also linked a very important petition below which aims to designate neo-Nazi and white supremacy groups as terrorist organizations. So, as always, if you're in a position to make a change, I'd be extremely grateful to you. Thanks for checking in and staying up to date. Stay freaky, stay informed. It may save your life.